Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 452. Not just any other edition, but my wife's birthday edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today is October 26, 2018. George, welcome back to the program. How's your busy life in Florida going? It's been a difficult week. I've uh, had the clergy conference. I've got a mother in the hospital up here and a daughter in the hospital down in Miami. Um, it's been tough. And to top it off, I'm broke. So <laughs> pay for all these fun things. <laughs> you know, but, our, but, God, you know, but our God reigns. He provides. And I'll get through this. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's times that you can read the book of Job and you're like, yeah, it doesn't apply. There's times you read the book of Job and say, I could teach Job something, you know. He's got nothing on me. Come on now. (laughs) He didn't have to be an Episcopal priest. Come on. I mean, you know, that's a cross that he never had to bear. No, he didn't. (laughs) Oh, man. Well, let's move to some news. We have some breaking news that I've not seen anybody else cover yet. Um, One of the great things about the show is we have sources, people who hear things or hear things firsthand or have documents or drafts of documents and they forward it to us and we were contacted last week by a source who said uh, you're not going to believe this but Justin Welby is telling people that the Anglican Church in North America is not going to be invited to Lambeth 2020 Um, and he hopes that even this is a tough decision that he's going to get 90 to 95 percent of the community to show up at Lambeth anyway. And I thought, boy, it's probably something to talk about if Justin Welby's already talking about it, you know, uh, two years in advance that he's not going to invite uh, the ACNA out there. Well, it saves money. You won't have to pay for them. Um, but there's a big political challenge here because it's no longer just the ACNA. It's the ACNA, ACNA and the Archbishop who represents GAFCON. So I thought we could talk about this. Uh, are you surprised at all by this, George? Yes and no. Uh, let's first off say that no formal uh, statement has been issued. We're, no, that's uh, not But, you know, we, we've been hearing various things from various meetings, and the preparations are going on for Lambeth, and we've been checking, and we've been getting neg- negative inferences. In other words, if I ask the question, is there any change to the traditional invitation list? Meaning, are you going to open the door to the ACNA and things of that nature? Oh, no, no changes. Things are going on as planned. We're going to continue. And here's all the. So, in asking, uh, this is a question of the dog that did not bark in the night. We can, uh, the Sherlock Holmes analogy from Silver Blaze, for right. those who yeah. are literary, uh, it's a dog that did not bark in the night. We've not had a direct statement that this is that the AC that Justin Welby has decided to call the bluff of GAFCON, but we've had reports that he has been telling members of the Compass Row Society, he's been telling the Lambeth Organizing Committee, he's been telling Episcopal Church leaders and Episcopal Church bishops this is what he plans to do, and we've had no information that contradicts this uh, statement of Justin Welby. However, if Lambeth Palace, Church House, or others want to release an official statement now that uh, George and Kevin have finally said something, you're welcome to do it. We will certainly print out on Anglican Inc. and talk about it in our next show uh, if you want to correct us or, val- or you know, confirm it. Now, what's, what I think is fascinating is that Justin Welby has decided to call the bluff of the Church of Nigeria and Church of Uganda. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've... Uh, we run a lot of little odds and ends on Anglican Inc. And one of them was a press release from the government of Mauritius, of all places. Now, I don't run government press releases from Mauritius, nor do I run them from every little country in the world. Josiah Daiwu Faron, the general secretary of the ACC, happened to be in that country and had a meeting with the Bishop Ian Ernest and met with the president and gave some very nice, sweet remarks about how wonderful they are in Mauritius. What in God's name is just is Josiah Dawifarun doing in Mauritius? He's making sure that the province of the Indian Ocean shows up to Lambeth because it's new archbishop, uh, the bishop of the Seychelles. He went to Gafka. That's right. Yeah. And he is uh, on the uh, side of the angels, so to speak. But Josiah Dawifarun is seeking to undermine the primate and seeking to get people to say, well, you know, 
just because you come to the party doesn't mean you're breaking fellowship with those who don't come. So we're seeing a very concerted effort to undermine the archbishops uh, of Gafcon by appealing over their heads to their bishops. So we have uh, Kenyans put in charge of some of the operations of the Lambeth Conference, which puts a great deal of pressure on a weak archbishop, Jackson Ole Sapit, to say, go. We have uh, pressure on the Nigerians. There are going to be maybe one or two who break ranks, older people, older fellows sure. who want one, one last hurrah uh, before they retire. Um, we see the same with Uganda. Um, we'll, uh, they're trying to peel off people and basically show that the, that the threats put forward by uh, Nigeria and Uganda can't be taken seriously. Essentially what they're saying is these are loud, noisy Africans who are having a temper tantrum. It'll all blow over. And well, business will the, be back to you. That is the hope. And uh, largely we see over time uh, n not just with Anglican, but in other uh, areas of argument. As time goes on, people are less, you know, likely to get their their dander up, and do start to talk together and say, "Well, what harm could go from visiting Lambeth? It's a free trip. I'll probably have tea with the Queen, uh, that type of thing." So, you know, we'll see if uh, Justin's bet plays off. Uh, but I think Gafcon after Gafcon three is at its strongest. And, well, yeah. yes and yes and no, yes and no. Gafcon's weaknesses, as we've mentioned many times, is that it's a primatially led organization. That's the biggest weakness. Its yes. base, its base is weak, and so you can have defections by bishop. West Africa, for instance, Justice of Crawley was one of the founding Gafcon primates. West Africa is firmly in the uh, Welby camp right now. New primate, new way of thinking, mm -hmm. and because. Now, let me go in a different direction from what you're saying, Kevin. Um, I have argued that it is in the political interests of Nigeria and Uganda to go to Gafka, uh, to go to Lambeth 2020, because they have the critical mass to swing things their way. In other words, there are enough of them that they can influence the debate and the conversation, just like we saw at Lambeth 1998. However, they felt that it's best for their uh, ends not to go, and I and I'm afraid. I'm afraid we're we're seeing a battle of cultures here. Um, Welby's what Welby's definition of victory is very different from the Gafcon definition of victory. Welby's definition of victory is to have a good party, to have a good bureaucratic outcome. Uh, for the Nigerians and the Ugandans and the Gafcon primates, their definition of victory is the coming kingdom of Christ. <laughs> and I know we can be that, that sounds silly, but really that's what we're talking about. A yeah. bishop in the Church of England is a very different creature than a bishop in, in most African churches. No, I, I absolutely agree. Um, it, it, different goals, different ways to get there. Uh, in, in terms of Church of England, um, Archbishop Justin Welby is the perfect Archbishop. He's the perfect Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, came to faith later in life, uh, has political background, has international experience, worked in business, hates business. Um, you know, it's every, every, you know, every dream uh, that a place like England could have is found in Archbishop Welby. As far as the terms of the Anglican Communion, He's the exact opposite of something they're looking for. See, we really are fully, fully enthralled to the Erastian, meaning state connection, uh, of the Church of England and its bishops. Uh, it's not been this bad probably since the 1700s and the Hanoverian times. Once Very upon good. a the, now I'm not an Anglo-Catholic, but the Oxford movement did do tremendous good and one of those things was to remind people that the place of the bishop is at his altar that a bishop is a bishop at the altar not a bishop at his desk now what does that mean we've had a little uh, fluff or two in the British newspapers about another woman bishop now gets to sit in the house of lords the bishop of v Bristol Vivian Fall who uh, is now seated among the leaders of the government by being a member of the House of Lords and a Church of England bishop. That's what's important. 
that she has a place that society and the secular world values as having influence. Not that she is a priest of Jesus Christ, not that she's a bishop of the church who seeks to bring the kingdom and salvation to those who will hear the word of God, but that she be shown to be important. We look at the Bishop of London, we look at so many of these bishops of the Church of England, and they're non-entities. They're yeah. empty suits who are there not because of any spiritual or meritocracy. Well, that's not fair. From an English that's perspective... Little, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's a little too that, what, no, From an English perspective, they may merit their positions because they have a very different criteria of what a bishop stands for and does mm -hmm. than we see in other parts of the Anglican world. And this is part of the, the disconnect between the, 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 the two-thirds world and the churches in the north. But the Episcopal Church is totally bought into the culture and the word. I mean, it's a creature of the culture. It doesn't stand athwart against the culture. It seeks well, to accommodate itself. The difference I see, Christ. the difference I see between uh, the Church of England and the Episcopal Church is the Episcopal Church is actually trying to lead culture, not just follow. You and know, we're also better paid. But that's you're better it. paid. <laughs> you know, where culture's not doing it hard enough, the Episcopal Church wants to go in there, tell culture where they're wrong, and how to be more liberal about uh, the way they do things. Where the Church of England just happy kind of to be a step behind uh, what's happening now. Uh, but but Kevin, here here's where here's how your point comes back and is totally validated. Justin Welby, from that perspective, is the ideal Archbishop of Canterbury, because he's going to keep the Church of England not ahead of the curve, but on the he's riding the wave. They're going to keep on the crest of culture, and for the Church of England, that's the sort of Archbishop you want. Not somebody who stands for eternal verities, not somebody who stands for the gospel, but somebody who stands for the institution and its relevance to the culture in which it, it finds itself. So we have two stories to talk about with the Episcopal Church. Um, we talked right after General Convention about the effects of this new resolution that was going to force the hand of dioceses to not just accept gay marriage, but to have it performed in their diocese, whether or not their bishop approved of same-sex marriage. And you and I talked about this extensively. Uh, we probably devoted three episodes over time as it was uh, being brought out. And I know uh, Alan and I talked about it. Uh, we are now to that point. We're to the point where many dioceses have one, two, or three churches within their uh, realm that says, okay, it's on the books at General Convention that we can seek to have same-sex marriages uh, in our church. We just have to tell you about it. We don't have to ask permission. We are going to put that trump card here. What are you going to do about it? And I'm watching diocese after diocese at their conventions and clergy conferences start to deal with this and ask the hard questions. Um, you had a clergy conference this week, I know it was hard, um, and I'm betting this was topic number one. Well, we had a, a guest speaker who did a marvelous job, but we also had several sessions with, we had a session where Bishop Greg Brewer spoke of the Diocese of Central Florida's response to General Convention Resolution B012. Now, Okay, Bishop can I stop? Well, I, I want to interrupt. I'm sorry I'm interrupting you here. We seldom talk about people we work for. And I want to be sure that uh, George isn't talking out of turn. He has permission to talk about this. Yes, and, the bishop. Uh, this, yeah. this was public, and the diocese will release a statement which will be the foundation stone. So if I misspeak, I'm not the final word. But I'll, I'll, re I'll relate my understanding. Um, the bishop shared uh, what this says, what this does, and Bishop Brewer's uh, comments uh, were rather strong. He felt this was a rather slapdash resolution. Um, it was, he said there was an older group within the General Convention who were, who were seeking victory at all costs. A small group uh, has been seeking to rewrite the marriage rights. And these new uh, rights, one for the blessing of a relationship, any sort of relationship, cohabitation, one for the blessing of a gay civil marriage, and one for church gay marriage. 
were the last hurrah, so to speak, of the Jack Spong generation. The most, and Bishop Brewer said, one of the most surprising things at General Convention in the House of Bishops, and especially the deputies, is it was the old folks who were pushing this. Younger people, even those who support the notion of same-sex marriage, are saying, look, you're going to be giving us a poison chalice because you're changing the whole nature of the Episcopal Church to a congregational one, mm -hmm. where the local local church decides and the bishop just as a manager at his desk. And now I do want to correct you one thing. A local parish, if the bishop said, uh, uh, the bishop, did, if it were in the Book of Common Prayer, then you're right. The bishop has no say over it. But these are still experimental rites, and so you have to get permission. But the General Convention says you now must give permission. That's right. If if a if a rector or person or clergy in charge of a of a congregation and the congregation requ request uh, gay marriages, you must permit it at, or make alternative uh, pastoral oversight available. And so we asked what this meant. What does this mean in Central Florida? There are only one and a half congregations out of maybe a hundred that this would be applicable to. First off, the cathedral, because the dean is under the bishop and all the missions are under the bishop. Bishop Brewer said, no, this is, a, this is not a godly issue. I will not permit it. So missions and the, and the cathedral can't even raise a question. Only freestanding parishes. Then the, then the rector and not the vestry, but the congregation must make the request. So what that means is that the two parishes we have who may want to do this, um, the rector has to want to do it. They will have to have a couple who want this. In other words, they can't just do this philosophically. Oh, wouldn't it be nice if we could? You need to have a concrete example. And then you need to have a congregational vote. Just like when we had when we had these disaffiliations uh, ten years ago, That's right. it's not the vestry deciding; it's a congregational vote, where the bishop brewer will lay out the consequences. Now we haven't quite figured out what the consequences are. S Dallas George Sumner has laid out the consequences. I understand. I could. I, I may be wrong, but my understanding is that if you elect to go down this road, then essentially you will still pay your assessment to the Diocese of Dallas. You'll still have voice and vote at convention, but for all intents and purposes, you'll be part of the new Episcopal Diocese of Fort Worth. I will not confirm, I will not visit, I will no longer be your bishop in anything other than in name. Sam Howard on Jacksonville who is made the same essential statement. Greg Brewer is deciding how hard do I go? Do I uh, and what was difficult was that this was a very emotional meeting because we have been safe in Central Florida. We have a good group of people. We're growing. We have things to celebrate every day. And this really is discouraging to find, uh, and many, many clergy voice discouragement. And so the Bishop Grower is going to announce how he's going to handle these exceptions. Now, um, some successions were, well, these, these one or two parishes must bear the cost of a flying bishop. What does that mean? Well, we've got to hire somebody, an old guy, who can accept quarter, quarter, uh, quarter pay, mm -hmm. 30, 40,000. And if you're the only parish that wants it, you've got to cover the costs. Now, that's a suggestion. They may not have to come to that, but they still have to pay their 12% to the diocese. And on top of that, they've got to pay for this alternative bishop. You've got to pay to play. Where have I heard that before? From I don't know. It's something going on around there. Um, but this is uh, this has really been a dis uh, personally. It's been a destructive week for me, both with family issues mm -hmm. and to see something see something that I really tr cherish uh, be attacked like this. Um, and we also discussed the fact unofficially discussion. Um, Albany's got it much worse. Yeah. Uh, uh, every diocese is going to have to deal with this individually. And, you know, Bishop Love, uh, I think, would probably have it the worst because of issues with the standing committee and having more churches, uh, maybe even the cathedral, 
who want to go down this route. Now he obviously be in charge of the cathedral, say no way Jose, uh, but I can think of six churches right off the top of my, my, my head that would say we want the right to do it. I don't know if they, probably two would push forward, uh, but uh, that's hard. And see what is hard is, is that this is so, this is naked political power grab that has nothing to do with building the kingdom of God. It's not like Central Florida uh, checks your uh, membership card and saying, are you gay? Well, you can't come here, or anything like that. But it's a uniformly, be it evangelical, charismatic, Anglo-Catholic, or high church, or broad church, it's a uniformly faithful diocese with one or two clergy who I don't think fit in, but we must now accommodate ourselves to them. If you take a step back and you look at what presiding Bishop Michael Curry wants in a diocese, wants in the life of church, he could certainly point to Central Florida and say, they're growing. That's what, that's what we're looking for. They you know, spread the, the love of God. They talk about Jesus, you know, the whole Jesus movie. I, I see that happening in Central Florida. Oh, look over there, Dallas. They're doing it too. You know, that is what we're looking for. And I can point to all the liberal dioceses, uh, those who don't have a firewall, those who don't, no longer have a cause for Christ, and I can't see Michael Curry saying, yeah, that's what we're looking for right there. You know, they, they allow anything in the diocese except Christ. And now, what Bishop, now, Bishop Brewer did give some words of encouragement and hope in that this is a work in process, B012. It's the, the end has not been done. And he is entertaining suggestions and ideas in ways um, now that it can be effectively implemented and be faithful to Christ. Now here, here's something I want to share. Um, I actually like Michael Curry. Uh, I don't agree with him theologically, but Michael Curry has, by his actions, demonstrated an ability to live and let live, that we will figure this out at the eschaton, but I will support you if you support me and we'll together bring people to Jesus Christ. Um, I'm happy with that degree of ambiguity. There are some, though, within the Episcopal Church that demand fealty to their point of view. And mm -hmm. what I think is especially discouraging is that the conservative bishops left in the Episcopal Church, the 8, 12, dozen, up to 15, 20, are looking to Justin Welby to be their lifeline. Aye. Because he is saying, he's talking, See, he's been, met with them, and he's talked to them, and he is basically using vocabulary that makes them think he's one of them. But I'm not sure that that's true. I, we know it's not true. We know that he is a middle manager with a... Uh, I don't want to talk about somebody's belief in Christ. Uh, he's, he's exactly what England was looking for for their uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. And it's so sad to look back at people who still think there's salvation through Canterbury, that there's a solution, another meeting. If Canterbury would, oh, maybe I should apply for a panel of reference. I bet he would listen to this. I was in Chicago, in Wheaton, at a conference oh, three years ago, and I was sitting at a table with some foreign archbishops, uh, uh, some from the, the Southern Cone, or bishop from the Southern Cone, who was right there penning a letter to the new Archbishop Welby. And he said, I know this guy believes, and I know he will help us out. And when I last saw this guy, I said, did you ever hear back from Welby? Not a, not a, not a word. And I don't think you're gonna find any solution through Canterbury here. GAFCON offers a solution. Is it the perfect solution? I don't know, but it, it, it's, you know, I, and I don't and know it's, if it's a solution for Central Florida. You no, know. probably not. Probably not because some of the GAF, because the, uh, not all, but there were some GAFCON leaders who have been so incredibly unkind to Greg Brewer. Mm -hmm. We had the flap over Trinity Episcopal Seminary where Greg was a professor there and a trustee. And because of how uh, some people perceived he handled an issue, a pastoral blow up at the cathedral, he was asked not to be a, a trustee anymore. And which I know is, which I assume, 
because I don't know his heart and mind, was a devastating thing to be repudiated by people you had walked together with and who they know hopefully knew you and you hopefully knew them. So there is a degree of personal animus among the older generation and leadership of the ACNA. Um, you know, at the Nairobi GAFCON conference, there was one a new ACNA bishop who demanded that I be excluded because I was an Episcopalian. Like I had cooties. Now, I don't, uh, I wasn't because uh you're denying cooties okay all right <laughs> well i i wasn't i wasn't ex, i wasn't ex, i said okay uh so there are two episcopalians here me and professor Knoll. so you're going to kick us both out <laughs> mm, mm, i guess not uh because of the failings of human be a men mm -hmm. uh, it's so easy to sit on the sidelines and say oh well, you should do this you should do that yet um, the reality is we live in a bro evil exists and we must find ways to carry out our ministry for building the kingdom in the midst of evil circumstances and situations I uh, one of my favorite movies I'm gonna give you a movie reference Kevin how's this for being geeky but it's not Battlestar Galactica uh, uh, there's a there's an old John Wayne Robert Montgomery movie called they were expendable their PT boat uh, cap uh, skippers and the Jap and it's 1941, early 42, and they and Bataan in the Philippines, Corregidor, and they uh, they get word that a Japanese convoy is coming down to land troops, and they're so excited because they want to rush out and be heroes, and use their boats to sink the Japanese destroyers and battleships, and they get orders to go see the admiral. The admiral says you have duty to run dispatches between Corregidor and uh, Cavite, uh, mainland. And they look crestfallen. John Robert Montgomery looks crestfallen, and the admiral says, "Son, you and I are professionals. Sometimes the manager says bunt, and you have to bunt and to win for the team." That's right. A parish priest, if he is faithful, sometimes has to bunt and take one for the team. I mean, what is the purpose of my ministry? To be bright, or to be amongst and with and love the people whom God has called me to serve? It's much more glamorous to try to sink the Japanese battleship than it is to run dispatches. It's much more glamorous to say, well, we're the special forces of the American world. Well, the reality is some of us have to be dispatch runners and do the daily work of Christ in building the kingdom one person at a time. And it, uh, it's discouraging because I, you know, we, I said we want to be heroes, but we all can't. Uh, in your terms, it's kind of ironic that you're not fighting the Japanese. You're trying to sink the Titanic, which is doing a fine job all by itself. Um, well, who yeah. won the war, Kevin? We won the war. <laughs> That's right. Um, we, at the end of the war, good guys finally <laughs> turned out. And guess what, Kevin? At the end of our war, we're going to win, too. Well, yeah, I mean, right we, now, we know who wins. It's just a, it's a hassle. Yeah. No. It, and it's and we're not English. We're not rejoicing in a noble defeat. You know, that's one of the things I dislike about the English character. They they celebrate their disasters uh, as disasters, uh, yeah. where the American character is to celebrate our victories in spite of our disaster. <laughs> we're going to win. We're just in a time of utter collapse and disaster. Well, I mean, as Gavin and I talked about at the end of the last show we did, there's so much hope and good news out there. You know, it, it, you know, beneath the vision of what you see in the, on, on the upper scale of the politics of the church, uh, it's working, and it's working well. People are coming to faith, uh, adult baptisms, child baptisms uh, throughout the world, Iran, Iraq, uh, China, uh, communist countries, uh, Islamic countries, uh, Buddhist like Anto, countries. Florida. Lacanto, Florida. I uh, can't speak so highly yet of Connecticut, but we're working hard on it. Um, and so it is working and it does work when applied correctly. Uh, George and I, we talk, you know, once a week about the, the best uh, politici we call the, the Anglican Communion. And uh, we see it working uh, in areas. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to report on that as well. I'm Kevin Carlson.
No, no, before you close, before you say you're Kevin Close, and I, there's one thing. You haven't asked our, our viewers to like the show. Click likes. Oh, and Why? Second, it's only the first thing I'm here. <laughs> second, yeah, and, uh, yeah. Share. Sure. You do sure. your bit, and I'll do my little bit. Okay, all right, yeah, I'll do my bit. So you've reached the end of the program. Congratulations. This is a long program, a whole 31 minutes. You guys are troopers. You, you know, th This is your Job story. I did episode 452 of Unscripted. Yeah, okay, good. Congratulations. If you want to comment and correct us, go to the YouTube channel and click on this episode. Go down there. You guys are the best commenters there are because you're very polite when we make a mistake. Go for it. If you're not subscribed yet, you're not getting instant updates on your browser and your email that there's a new episode, click subscribe. For those highbrow viewers who like to just use podcasts, we have a podcast as well. If you go to the YouTube channel, click on a show. In the show notes is how to get to the podcast. George, what's up? I want our viewers to pray. Pray specifically for some people. To pray for Greg Brewer. He is mm -hmm. going to be vilified. Uh, I believe he will be vilified by some people for the uh, stance that he's taken. Pray for Greg Brewer. Pray for Bill Lowe. Pray for George Sumner. Pray for Sam Howard. Pray for all of these communion partner bishops. Pray for Justin Welby. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing is impossible with the Lord. Pray exactly. for Justin Welby. Pray, pray for, for Michael Curry. Absolutely. Pray, yeah. And pray for GAFCON as they uh, deal with the struggle of, of Lambeth and the decisions that should be made. You know, and, and what we're and the specific prayer that we're asking for is that God's will be made known and they, mm -hmm. that they be given the gift of gift of discernment. I don't particularly care about victory. I care about that God's will be done, which is not my victory, but his victory. And that's what I, I hope our viewers, I hope our viewers don't hear us. I know we can be entertaining and partisan and funny and we like to get our little elbows out, but we do need to pray for these people who have greater responsibilities than you or I have, Kevin. Well, certainly than I have. Uh, way above my pay grade. No, I agree. But, um, but, but that, that God work in their lives so that they can be a light to the world. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it will happen. If he can use me and my little patch of the earth, he can use anybody. Seriously. If Anglican TV can even exist, yeah, he can use anybody. Absolutely. Now, on this very high note, can I do my closing? Yes. Okay. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode, I have to look, 452 of Anglican Unscripted.